What's up guys? It's yo boy Omnisensei. Welcome to, What if I was reborn in Naruto as Uchiha and Uzumaki Hybrid? Part 7. Like, share and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. So you purposefully let your clones be discovered? Yano asked, studying Renjiro's face and body language. Renjiro nodded, I also ordered them to use the few earth nature jutsus that I knew here and there to fully paint the picture that Shinobi from Iwagakure attacked the nobles. It's a deception within a deception. At first, they would suspect the IWA Shinobi in the city, but after they noticed that most of the damage caused was by wind jutsus, they'll eventually conclude that Suna Shinobi did this. Them concluding this on their own would make them less likely to even think that someone might be impersonating Suna Shinobi. Yano felt a shiver run down his spine. That is frightening and also smart, he thought. The sheer ingenuity of Renjiro's plan forced him to compare Renjiro to his own clan head, a notorious schemer. He was in awe of Renjiro's idea and couldn't help but start seeing him in a different light. With the way he is quick on his feet plus his wits, he might be a good candidate for. Yano's thoughts trailed off as he was interrupted by Renjiro's question. What's next? Have we completed our mission, or do we need to stay here? No, Yano replied, shaking off his thoughts. First, we will wait and see how the capital reacts. With Asa being here, they might first suspect him. Once we have gauged their response, then we can decide where and when to apply pressure or just leave. Renjiro nodded, and they both made their way back to the caravan's quarters. As they did, Renjiro couldn't help but think, I already have a present waiting for Asa the next time he goes to the daimyo's court. In his quarters, Asa was in the middle of a crisis. The guards and shinobi in the capital city had already determined that his squad was not responsible for what happened to the nobles since they had not taken a foot out of their quarters, which were closely monitored. Despite this, Asa couldn't shake the feeling of a noose tightening around his neck. What is happening? Asa thought, pacing back and forth. No, this cannot be happening. I had been planning for this for a while. After I defeated the Four Tails and handed it to the village, I knew that I needed to strike first and get the daimyo's support. So who is planning against me? Is Anoki scheming against me? I am not sure whether he knows what I am doing, and even if he knew, he wouldn't bother doing anything since he always looks down on me because I only have a Kekiai Genkai while he has dust release. Asa stopped and looked around the room. His squad was quiet, each member deep in their own thoughts. One of his squad members, Okumer, finally spoke up. Lord Asa, what should we do? The guards have nearly vindicated us, but the fact that the people identified near the homes of the dead nobles were shadow clones is a problem. Asa clenched his fists, with the murders being shadow clones makes me think that maybe Kanoha is involved. Or maybe Anoki paid some mercenaries to frame Kanoha? His mind raced with possibilities. We need to stay calm, Asa said, trying his best to reassure his squad Okumer nodded, understood, Lord Asa. Asa continued to pace, if it's Kanoha, they would need a very good reason to interfere here. They wouldn't risk a conflict with the land of earth without significant cause. On the other hand, if it's Anoki, he would need to be very subtle. He wouldn't openly attack his own shinobis unless he had a plan to benefit from it. But why use shadow clones? Unless. Asa stopped, his eyes widening as a new thought occurred to him. Unless Anoki wanted to create confusion and make it look like Kanoha was involved. But that's a risky move, even for him. No, there has to be more to this. Asa was deep in his thoughts, trying to piece together the fragmented puzzle of the conspiracy against him when he was disturbed by an attendant. The attendant, dressed in the traditional garb of the daimyo's court, bowed slightly and gestured for Asa to follow him. It was time for Asa to report his findings to the daimyo. Asa knew this wasn't a benevolent gesture from the daimyo. While it might appear that the daimyo was giving him a chance to clear his name, Asa understood the underlying ploy. 
The daimyo was setting the stage to wash his hands of Asa should he make any mistake regarding this matter. The court officials were like a pack of beasts, waiting to pounce on any sign of weakness or failure from Asa. As Asa walked through the grand corridors of the palace, he thought ruefully, it seems that the daimyo has already made his decision on my proposal. Nevertheless, Asa had vowed to himself that he wouldn't give them the chance to undermine his cause. Failure here would give Anoki the justification he needed to eliminate him once and for all. Upon entering the daimyo's hall, Asa was greeted by the imposing figure of the daimyo seated on his ornate throne. The hall was filled with court officials, all of whom turned their scrutinizing gaze on Asa as he entered. Asa, I hope that you come with good news, the daimyo said immediately as Asa entered the hall. Asa bowed deeply, yes, Lord Daimyo, he said, his voice steady. After investigating the matter, we found out that the shinobi responsible were from other villages. The daimyo raised a brow, why in which villages? Before Asa could respond, a snide remark came from Yuzhui, one of the high-ranking officials in the daimyo's court. Now he wants to blame another village. Asa felt a surge of annoyance but kept his composure. He ignored the remark and continued, the assailants were all clones, and after eliminating them, we found out that they were shadow clones. The hall erupted in murmurs. The revelation that shadow clones were involved pointed unmistakably to Konoha, as the technique was widely recognized as one of their specialties. The daimyo's eyes narrowed. What are you trying to say, Asa? Before Asa could answer, Yuzhui interjected again, Kanoha cannot be involved here. Asa is just trying to distract us from the fact that he came here to the capital to commit these acts. Ignoring Yuzhui's interruption, Asa continued, Lord Daimyo, the killings were committed using wind chakra nature. So it is either Shinobi from Kanoha or Suna behind this. Suna must be behind this, a voice shouted from the assembled officials. Given the cold relations between the land of wind and the land of earth, this conclusion was expected. No one argued against this until Yuzhui spoke again, why are you idiots falling for this? Asa was clearly behind this attack. He is trying to kill us before he. Yuzhui couldn't finish his statement because the atmosphere in the hall shifted dramatically. A heavy, oppressive presence filled the room as Asa flared his chakra. The sudden change in the atmosphere silenced everyone, and all eyes turned to Asa. As Asa flared his chakra, an oppressive tension filled the hall. The guards subconsciously reached for their weapons, their faces taut with nervousness. They were acutely aware that the few shinobi capable of stopping Asa, who had recently attained S-rank status, were not present. Even if they were to be summoned, with the time they could arrive, Asa could have destroyed the capital city ten times over with his power. But Asa wasn't flaring his chakra because he had grown tired of Yuzhui's snide remarks. Such an action would only worsen his already precarious situation. Instead, Asa had sensed something strange whenever he focused on Yuzhui who had been annoying him with his remarks. While he did have some bias against the noble, he needed to check something. In front of the eyes of everyone present, Asa seemed to teleport as he flickered and appeared in front of the seated Yuzhui. What is this? Asa thought as he appeared in front of Yuzhui and placed his arm on the noble's shoulder. Without hesitating, Asa immediately inserted some of his chakra into the noble. Is he trying to kill Lord Yuzhui? Takaki, the chief guard of the daimyo, thought as he and his team reacted quickly, flickering to Asa. But the moment they arrived, Asa pulled away his arm from Yuzhui. Don't worry. He was under a Jinjutsu and I disrupted his chakra breaking it. This means that the killers might still be in the city. Lord Daimyo, I suggest we lock down the capital city as I handle this, Asa said before he disappeared leaving everyone in the hall confused. Everything had happened in a matter of seconds, and only the guards who were shinobi could react quickly. It was only after Asa left that all the officials, Daimyo included, realized what had just happened. Jinjutsu? W.S. that why Lord Yuzhui was opposing all of Asa's suggestions. Someone remarked causing a new round of murmurs to spread in the room as the officials began discussing what had happened. Yes, Lord Asa is a powerful shinobi. It would be crazy trying to provoke him even if it was the daimyo. Another added. The murmurs continued and gradually increased until a shout was heard. You heard him. Lock down the city, the daimyo screamed at his guards. They had kept the matter of the nobles dying under wraps until they could find a solution to the situation 
But now that Asa had confirmed that the killers might be present, they had to be more proactive with the whole situation. While the officials and the daimyo were still processing what had just happened, Asa flickered to the entrance of the city. He thought, I am sure I sensed that chakra before. The one that cast that Jinjutsu on Yuzhui. I can't remember from whom I sensed it, but I remember sensing it when I arrived in the capital city. It is clear that they are targeting me. Asa was proud of his sensory abilities since he was one of the top sensors in IWA without any Kekiai Genkai helping him in that regard. Asa enveloped the whole city with his chakra field as he tried to trace the suspicious chakra he had sensed from Yuzhui. There it is, he muttered as soon as he narrowed down on it. It was dull but he still managed to find it. Asa then flickered to the market. Renjiro and Yano, who were in the market playing their roles as merchants, were immediately alarmed when they felt someone covering the city with their chakra field. What is this? It seems familiar. Are our covers blown? Renjiro thought as he spared a glance to Yano who had the same confused look on his face. A few seconds later, Asa appeared in front of Renjiro. Wasn't this the man that I was staring at me when I arrived here? Asa thought. Recognizing the man in front and his colleague, Asa first scanned them with his chakra field and once he ascertained that they were his targets, he immediately acted. Asa kicked the ground and used the earth pillar jutsu causing two earth pillars to emerge beneath Yano and Renjiro's feet, launching them into the air. Before they could even get a chance to get their bearings, Asa jumped into the air and successively launched two continuous kicks at both of their launched figures. Boom! The force Asa used was so strong that Renjiro heard his bones crack. Since the market was just beside the city's entrance and city walls, Yano and Renjiro were literally kicked out of the capital city and crashed into the surrounding hills. Why? We are just merchants. Renjiro, still in his persona, tried to plead as he got up, but Asa wasn't going to hear any of that. Asa shouted, a normal merchant would have already died from that. How many of you are there? You have spoiled a lot of my plans and need to pay for it. Yano and Renjiro did not break character and continued pleading, which only angered Asa further. He made a hand sign. There's no need pretending, I can already see through your disguises. The ground split open as lava emerged from it. Asa shouted, lava release, lava snake bullet. Is that lava release? Renjiro thought as he tried to dodge the powerful snake heading towards him, while Yano thought, an S-rank shinobi, this is dangerous. Yano quickly retrieved one of the kunai Minato had handed to them and threw it a couple of meters behind him. As the kunai sailed through the air, Ace's lava snakes hissed and snapped at Renjiro and Yano. The heat was intense, the ground bubbling and cracking under the pressure of the molten rock. Renjiro barely dodged the first attack, the heat singeing his clothes and hair. Yano, using his agility, managed to evade the serpentine streams of lava, but he knew they couldn't keep this up for long. The Jutsu Asa had used formed two giant powerful snake locking in on the target. His having the lava release was one of the reasons why he won against the four tails Jinchuriki as they both used the same Kekiai Genkai. His Kekiai Genkai was also one of the reasons why Asa was conceited and wanted to become the next Suchikage. The lava release, an already established Kekiai Genkai, was just a step in Asa's ladder of power as he unlocked it when he was learning dust release. Unlike his father, the second Suchikijmu, who had earth and wind as his main chakra affinities, Asa only had lightning as his chakra affinity which he inherited from his mother. This was the reason why it was harder for him to master dust release since his chakra affinity was not among the chakra natures required to form the Kekiai Toda. Fortunately for him, he was lucky and he awakened a Kekiai Genkai while studying the Kekiai Toda. This just showed how much of a problem Asa would be when he mastered dust release as well as lava release. He would be one, if not the strongest, shinobi alive. We need to get out of here. Yano shouted to Renjiro, who nodded in agreement. The kunai Yano had thrown was their only hope. Asa's relentless attacks were leaving them no room to counterattack or even defend properly. Why are you doing this? Asa demanded, his voice booming over the chaos. Why impersonate IWA Shinobi and disrupt everything? Even while dodging and trying their best to counter, Yano and Renjiro did not resort to any jutsu for other chakra natures apart from wind. While they did not know how Asa figured them out, they had to fully commit to the mission. Asa's eyes narrowed. Very well. If you won't talk, 
Then I'll make you. He raised his hands, and more lava surged from the ground, forming into larger, more menacing shapes. Just as he was about to unleash another wave of destruction, the kunai Yano had thrown earlier shimmered and sparked. In a flash, Minato appeared beside it, his presence immediately shifting the dynamics of the battlefield. It was dead in the night when a lone man was working tirelessly in his office. This man, with olive skin and shoulder-length black locks, was Satetsu, the third Kazakage. Satetsu sighed, glancing at the formidable stack of papers beside him. Each scroll and document seemed to taunt him with their unending demands. Being the Kazakage is far more tiresome than I expected, he mused. I always saw Shaman Sama complain and thought he was just lazy. Maybe this is fate's way of paying me back. It had only been a few years since Satetsu had reluctantly taken up the mantle of Kazakage. He was forced, or rather compelled, by his clan and the wind daimyo, to step into a role he never truly desired but had to occupy. Just after the last Shinobi War, the second Kazakage, Shaman, had met his end during the siege of Yuzushiogakure. The news of Shaman's death had struck the village like a storm. Shaman had been a revered leader, a guiding light for the village during turbulent times. His death left a void that needed to be filled, and the villagers, in their unanimous decision, turned to Satetsu. Initially unwilling, Satetsu had tried to refuse the position. He was more of a scholar than a fighter, dedicating most of his life to research. With the support of Shaman, the second Kazakage, Satetsu had delved into the mysteries of Shikaku, the one-tailed beast. His research enabled Satetsu to mimic the one-tailed beast's sand manipulation by developing the magnet release Kekiai Genkai. This unique ability allowed Satetsu to convert his chakra into magnetic forces, which, when combined with iron powder, enabled him to mimic Shikaku's sand manipulation. This power, although not born of the tailed beast, made Satetsu a formidable shinobi, and equal to his mentor, Shaman. While he would have preferred to be in his laboratory, surrounded by his experiments and books, Satetsu understood the necessity of his position. The village needed a leader, and he could not turn his back on his people. Thus, he put the village's interests first and became the third Kazakage. Knock! 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 A brisk knock on the door interrupted his thoughts. Satetsu straightened up. Enter, the door creaked open, and Hataka stepped inside, Lord Third, Hataka began, giving Satetsu a respectful bow. Another place has been hit. Satetsu's face remained expressionless, but his eyes hardened. That makes four villages in three days, he said, what of Ebizo-sama? Hataka shook his head, he has visited the two towns attacked but still did not find any tracks of the attackers. Satetsu leaned back in his chair, these attacks, they are too coordinated to be mere coincidences. Someone is targeting them deliberately. Just as Satetsu finished responding to Hataka, something caught his attention from the corner of his eye. A couple of meters from where he was sitting, a scorpion burrowed out of the sandy floor of his office. Satetsu recognized the scorpion immediately. Does Ru have any leads on what is happening? If she did, it would make things easier, Satetsu thought as he saw the scorpion. He immediately reached out and took the scroll from the scorpion, then unfurled it to read the message. As Satetsu read the scroll's contents, a flicker of emotion passed over his face, a rare occurrence. This subtle change did not go unnoticed by Hataka. While Satetsu was not one to wear his heart on his sleeve, after working under him for some time, Hataka knew that inside the hard exterior the Kazakage portrayed, he was just a big softy. They have attacked Ru and her clan. This is now bigger than I thought. I will have to trouble you, Hataka. Go and tell Kayasama that I need her to visit one of the towns while I go and personally track these people. While doing that, sort some of these papers, Satetsu instructed. Hataka nodded. He knew that Chio, an S-rank shinobi who had retired to focus on medical ninjutsu, rarely took up missions anymore. However, Satetsu was confident she would listen to the Kazakage since she had been his Jounin sensei, and he rarely asked her for favors. With those instructions, Satetsu quickly left his office, flickering away and leaving a few black particles in the air. Hataka watched him disappear and shook his head. He is the Kazakage. Why is he the first one to move in such a situation? I am sure he just wanted to get out of his paperwork, Hataka muttered to himself as he left the Kazakage's office to complete the orders he had been given. Hovering on his sand, 
which darkly gleamed under the cover of the moon, Satetsu moved swiftly towards Ru's location. He was sure she would have some leads on the assailants. While the distance was significant, Satetsu was sure that it would take him less than an hour to reach his destination. If Ru's clan has been attacked, this situation is indeed more severe than I anticipated. Since Ebizo-sama has not tracked them down, I will do it myself, he pondered. The attacks had already affected the food supply of the Land of Wind, which was severe since they were not like other nations such as the Land of Fire which had suitable lands for farming. This had also been a major reason why Suna and the Land of Winds as a whole wanted to conquer more land as it would help them mitigate damage whenever a hostile nation attacked them. Food supply and security were a glaring weakness that they had been trying to get rid of since the village was formed. So what do we do next? Hiro asked Sama. Minato had vanished, presumably to aid Yano and Renjiro, leaving Hiro and Sama alone in an exposed, barren stretch of desert. The location was far from ideal for setting up camp, and they were vulnerable without any immediate cover. I am not sure, but we need to create more distance between us and the last place we attacked. Sama replied, bending over to retrieve the kunai still stuck in the ground. While we still have the kunais Minato gave us, it's not safe to leave this here in the open. We can place this wherever we reach, she thought, carefully examining their surroundings. Which direction should we head to? Hiro mused aloud, his eyes scanning the horizon. Upon hearing that Sama thought back to earlier that day, using the position of the sun as her guide. The sun was rising from there when we placed the kunai here before noon, so that is east. We should probably head north, which is there. At least when Minato returns, we will be closer to the wind capital, she concluded. She gestured to Hiro, indicating the direction they should take, and they began flickering towards the north. They had become adept at navigating the desert terrain and they actually preferred traveling by night since it offered them the dual advantages of cooler temperatures and the cover of darkness. The night winds would help erase their tracks, making it harder for anyone to follow them. Hours passed as they moved swiftly and silently, the vast desert landscape stretching endlessly around them. Suddenly, Hiro halted abruptly, causing Sama to stop as well. What's wrong? Sama asked, concern evident in her voice. Do you hear that? Hiro replied, his ears straining to catch the faint noise he had detected. Hear what? Sama shook her head in confusion. It's sand, like moving sand, Hiro said, his tone serious. Sama chuckled lightly, thinking Hiro was overreacting. Is the wind bothering you? But then she felt it too, a subtle, but distinct chakra signature approaching them rapidly. Her expression shifted from amusement to alertness. They both knew that such a chakra presence in the middle of the desert was unusual and likely hostile. We need to hide, Sama whispered urgently. They moved quickly, seeking cover behind a nearby dune, their senses heightened and bodies tense. The approaching chakra grew stronger, and they tried their best to erase their presence and chakra signatures. What the hell is happening here? Is that lava? Are they fighting who I think it is? Minato thought immediately upon his arrival. The chaotic scene unfolding before him was startling, a fierce battle with Asa, a recently promoted S-rank shinobi from Iwagakure from what Minato had heard. Asa, still enraged, noticed Minato's sudden appearance. Hmm? Where did he come from? And he is wearing our normal shinobi attire. He must have been colluding with them and decided to come and save his comrades. It doesn't matter, he will suffer the same fate as them, he thought, eyes narrowing with suspicion and determination. Minato, Sama, and Hiro had been meticulous in their disguise preparations. When they attacked various locations in the Land of Wind, they wore masks to conceal their identities. Additionally, they also changed their appearances to resemble IWA Shinobi, ensuring that even if someone managed to glimpse beneath their masks, they would still accomplish their objective of framing Iwagakure Shinobi. Assessing the precarious situation, Minato quickly realized that Yano and Renjiro were in immediate danger. His sharp senses stretched out to detect any of his seals in the vicinity. This one will do, he thought with relief, noting that the seal he had placed on Renjiro's jumpsuit was still intact. In an instant, Minato appeared behind Renjiro and teleported both Renjiro and Yano, who were about to be swept away, or rather burnt, by an approaching wave of lava, back to where Yano had placed his kunai moments ago. When Yano and Renjiro first assumed the identities of merchants, 
they had not completely discarded their original clothes. Instead, they wore them underneath their merchant disguises, using the transformation jutsu to ensure everything appeared normal. What is going on? Minato demanded, his voice urgent as Ace's anger only increased, seeing his targets evade his attack. How did he do it? Is he that fast? Asa wondered, incredulous at Minato's speed. He discovered our disguises, Yano managed to answer, his voice strained. Renjiro quickly nodded in agreement, his face tense from the exertion and pain. Are you ignoring me? Asa shouted, his voice echoing through the desolate landscape. Do we fight him or leave? Renjiro asked. Both he and Yano had been doing their best to dodge and stay in character. They could not use most of their jutsus as it could be traced back to the village, something they did not want to happen. So Renjiro did not even dare to use his Sharingan which would have made the dodging easier. Nevertheless, Renjiro was not slow even without relying on his dojitsu. Ace's chakra flared once more, his eyes locked on the trio with unbridled fury. You won't escape this time, he snarled, preparing to unleash another devastating attack. Asa quickly made a series of hand signs before slamming his hands to the ground and shouting, lava release, collapsed eruption burial. Immediately, the ground beneath everyone's feet began to shake, and cracks appeared where they were standing. The cracks rapidly expanded, surrounding Minato, Yano, and Renjiro. The ground then split open, revealing lava that erupted, creating a fiery barrier around the three Kanoha shinobi. It's hot. It feels like I'm in a furnace, Renjiro thought as the lava started to envelop them. He quickly glanced at Minato, who was the reason he wasn't making any moves. Minato retrieved some of his kanais and threw them in various directions before the lava completely enveloped them. He then teleported Yano and Renjiro to a cliff where one of his kanais had landed, escaping Ace's attack. Do we fight or leave? Minato thought. I still don't know how their part of the mission is progressing so leaving might be a bad choice. Even if I leave a seal here, getting back would still cost me chakra that I cannot afford to lose in this situation. We also cannot stay and fight since that will risk us getting exposed if we use any of our special jutsu, especially for Yano. His vacuum wind style is widely known because of Danzo Sama, so they'll know where we are from. Minato's mind raced as he thought of his next move until an idea popped into his head. That's it. Turning to Yano, he asked, where did you guys put the kunai? Yano was confused and asked, which one? The one you were supposed to put in the capital city, Minato said. It is in the daimyo's hall. Why are you asking? Renjiro said. When he used Jinjutsu on Yuzui, he also handed the kunai to him and instructed him to place it anywhere in the hall. How did it even get there? Minato was confused but continued, the best way to end this is to get him out of here. Does he want to teleport him back to the city? Renjiro wondered as he asked, why? Minato didn't say anything as he flickered close to Asa and threw some of his kanais at him. They survived? How? I just... Asa couldn't even afford to complete the thought as he used his kanai to deflect the incoming projectiles. Minato's kanais landed behind Asa, and before Asa could even prepare for his next attack, he felt Minato appear behind him. In an instant, they disappeared and reappeared in the daimyo's hall at a corner where the kunai was placed, startling everyone still present in the hall. Immediately after, Minato quickly teleported back to Yano and Renjiro. How did your mission go? Minato asked when he appeared next to Yano and Renjiro. Did he already teleport him? Renjiro wondered as Yano answered, we have only killed some nobles in the capital city. Only that? We can still work with that. Minato thought as he asked, is it enough to suspect IWA and the land of Earth? Yano nodded. Good, we can head back and join Sama and Hiro. Minato nodded and prepared to teleport back when he felt a new seal placed in his network. The seal tugged him, and Minato complied, choosing it as his next destination. Immediately, they teleported and appeared in what felt like quicksand. They immediately began sinking deeper into the sand Renjiro could swear was moving. Where are we? Rinjiro thought before he heard a voice say, I won't ask again, who are you? As the question lingered, the three continued to sink deeper and deeper into the sand. Minato felt the granules sliding around his legs, pulling him down steadily. The sensation was unnerving as if the earth itself had come alive to swallow them whole. 
Minato tried to gauge where they were when he saw two figures in the distance. Unlike their own precarious position, these figures seemed to be drowning in the sand, so deep that only their heads were visible. The dim moonlight cast eerie shadows over their faces, making it difficult to identify them at first. Minato squinted, focusing his keen eyes on the two figures. Recognition hit him like a bolt of lightning. That's Hiro and Sama, he realized with a jolt. Relief and worry mingled in his chest. Renjiro, struggling to maintain his balance as the sand shifted beneath him, finally spotted the man who had questioned them earlier. The figure exuded an air of authority and power, hovering on some sand above them. Renjiro's eyes widened in recognition and fear. It's the third Kazakage. We just went from boiling rocks to sinking sand. The third Kazakage, Satetsu, stood tall, his piercing eyes observing the intruders with cold calculation. His presence was imposing, and the sand surrounding him hinted at his immense power. Minato knew they were in an even more precarious situation now. The third Kazakage was not someone to be trifled with. Besides Lord Third, Sakumo-sama and the Sanins, I don't think there's anyone in the village who could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. That said, we need to get out of this and help Hiro and Sama. Satetsu reputation as one of the strongest shinobi in the Land of Wind was well known and the stories of his battles were legendary despite him only being a kage for a few years as compared to the rest. We're sinking faster, Yano muttered. Minato glanced around, assessing their options. The sand continued to pull them down, and any sudden movement might quicken their descent. He had to think fast. Stay calm, he instructed. We need to find a way to stabilize ourselves. As they continued to sink, Minato reached out with his chakra, trying to find a kunai nearby to teleport them to safety. But the sand seemed to interfere with his sensing abilities, making it difficult to locate any of his placed seals. Can you teleport us out? Renjiro asked, his voice tight with urgency. Working on it, Minato replied, his mind racing. Think, Minato. There has to be a way out of this. Teleporting from the land of wind to the land of earth to heed Yano's signal had consumed a lot of Minato's chakra. For such vast distances, Minato could not directly teleport to the location but had to go through any of the seals he had placed along the way. With how limited the seals he had between the two countries were, the chakra expenditure only increased. And he made two such trips, bringing Yano and Renjiro back, so his chakra capacity was almost depleted. While the teleportation he did with Asa also consumed chakra, it was not significant compared to the back and forth from the capital city of the land of earth. Yano, Renjiro, use clones to get us out of this, Minato instructed. He could have done the same, but he was currently trying his best not to waste his already low chakra. It's going to be a bit hard, Renjiro thought. While making a shadow clone was easy, focusing on one's chakra when in such a precarious situation was a bit harder. The urgency and the instability of the sand added to the difficulty, but it was hard, not impossible. The two complied. Renjiro made two shadow clones directly above him to help him out of the sand. As the clones formed, they immediately went to work. Getting out of this would have been much easier if I could use my chains, but again, we have to restrain ourselves to unrecognizable jutsus. Renjiro thought. One of Renjiro's clones grabbed him by the hands while the other clone pushed against the sand, providing leverage. With a coordinated effort, Renjiro was lifted slightly out of the quicksand. The sand over there is still, Renjiro thought as he leveraged his two shadow clones to jump further from the quicksand. As he did, his shadow clones, still in the air, did the same for Minato, creating a stable platform for him to leap from. I knew that he could manipulate iron sand, but could he also do the same for normal sand? Minato thought as both he and Yano landed beside Renjiro, their shadow clones dispelling themselves upon completion of their task. We need to get Sama and Hiro away from him, Minato said urgently. How? Renjiro replied, still catching his breath. Minato quickly assessed the situation. We need a distraction. I'll create an opening, and you two grab Sama and Hiro. He glanced at Yano. Can you use your wind technique subtly enough not to reveal your identity? Yano nodded. I can manage that. Satetsu, the third Kazakage, wasn't a sensory ninja, but he had already noticed the trio the moment they arrived. He chose to do nothing, observing their sudden appearance with a calculating gaze. 
Though surprised that they seemed to materialize out of thin air, he quickly deduced that the three new arrivals were most likely working with the two shinobi he had captured. He figured they would come to him instead, and that was exactly what Minato did. He moved swiftly flickering as close as he could on steady ground and threw a kunai aimed at the Kazakage's feet. The Kazakage deflected it easily with his sand, but it served its purpose as Minato teleported to the kunai's location, now standing between the Kazakage and his captured comrades. You finally decided to come. Would you mind telling me what you are doing here? Satetsu asked calmly. He had already surmised the general intentions of this group of shinobi, the only thing left was to understand their reasons. Minato did not reply, causing Satetsu to flick his wrist, sending part of his sand toward Minato as sharp projectiles. Minato dodged them with ease, his reflexes sharp and precise. Meanwhile, Yano and Renjiro sprinted towards Sama and Hiro, attempting to free them from their sandy prison. However, Satetsu saw this and clenched his fist, causing the sand around Sama and Hiro to harden and constrict further, making it nearly impossible for them to be released. He wasn't about to let them escape so easily. Iron sand drizzle, he muttered, and immediately, his iron sand hardened into minuscule grains. These grains shot out across a vast range, moving so fast they were nearly invisible. Using the repellent force of magnetism, the speed of the bullets rapidly increased after they were launched, making them deadly projectiles. The iron sand drizzle was a technique that Satetsu had refined over the years. When he used it against Minato, he shaped his sand into sharp needles, increasing their lethality. This time, against Yano and Renjiro, he opted for the same strategy. The iron sand needles streaked through the air, aimed directly at the two shinobi. Minato, sensing the danger, shouted, Get down! He quickly summoned a barrier of chakra to shield his team. The iron sand bullets hit the barrier, some of them piercing through and narrowly missing their targets. Yano and Renjiro, reacting to Minato's warning, dropped to the ground. Dodging the bullets was useless as Satetsu ensured that it covered a vast area. Despite their efforts, a few of the iron sand needles grazed them, drawing thin lines of blood. The speed and precision of Satetsu's attack were overwhelming. I need a bigger distraction to deal with him. Minato was acutely aware of the power difference between him and Satetsu. As an elite Jounin, Minato knew he was outmatched against Akage, and with his chakra reserves running low, he had to be strategic. My chakras are low, but maybe this can get us out of here, Minato thought as he bit into his thumb, drawing blood. He quickly performed a series of hand signs and then slammed his hands onto the sandy ground. The blood seeped into the sand creating a seal and a thick cloud of smoke erupted from the point of contact, enveloping the area. When the smoke cleared, Minato could be seen standing on top of a giant toad with green skin and yellow pupils. This was Fukasaku, the toad sage. What is it, Minato boy? Satetsu's eyes widened slightly in surprise at the sight of Fukasaku. A summoning? Impressive, he muttered, his tone still calm but with a hint of curiosity. Fukasaku-sama, I need your help to create a distraction, Minato said urgently. Fukasaku nodded, understanding the gravity of the situation immediately. Got it, Minato boy. Fukasaku leapt into the air with impressive agility, aiming to land directly on Satetsu. Satetsu, however, was not caught off guard. With a swift motion, his sand whisked him away from the point of impact, but the force of Fukasaku's landing sent a shockwave through the ground, throwing Satetsu slightly off balance. He quickly regained his composure, his eyes narrowing as he studied the toad. Interesting. A summoning of this caliber means you're no ordinary shinobi, Satetsu commented, his gaze fixed on Minato. Minato watched Satetsu closely, his mind racing. He's as perceptive as I expected. We need to be careful, he thought. Satetsu, meanwhile, was making his own assessments. This toad looks similar to the one that Sanin, Jiraiya, summoned during the last war. The only difference is that the one he summoned looked more feminine with the purple hair and lips, Satetsu mused as he got a full view of Fukasaku. Indeed, Jiraiya had already made a summoning contract with the toads of Mount Mayaboku. Out of the few times he summoned the toads, he primarily called upon Shima. Shima's ability to use both fire and wind release made her a formidable ally, and her Jinjutsu capabilities complemented Jiraiya's fighting style perfectly. The toads were all in the golden ages of their lives, 
and Jiraiya planned to summon them both after they could control the size manipulation ability they just got whenever he needed to use Senjutsu, leveraging their combined strength and abilities. Fukasaku, not wasting any time, released a powerful wind blast from his mouth directed at Satetsu. The force of the wind was tremendous, tearing through the surrounding sand and creating miniature sandstorms. Satetsu stood his ground, his iron sand forming a protective shield around him. Such powerful winds, he muttered, more to himself than to his opponents. This will be more than interesting. As the Kazakage of a village in the land of wind, Satetsu was no stranger to powerful winds. The very nature of his environment had conditioned him to withstand such forces. Even as Fukasaku's wind raged and the sandstorms formed around them, Satetsu remained safe within his sand shield. The iron sand swirled protectively, creating a barrier that deflected the brunt of the wind blast. Minato, observing the situation, called out to his summon, Fukasaku-sama, I don't think your wind release can pierce through his sand defense. Fukasaku landed gracefully, nodding in agreement. Don't worry, Minato boy. His defense might be strong, it even reminds me of the one tail, but I can still find a way to bypass it. Without missing a beat, Fukasaku leapt into the air once again. This time, he gathered a torrent of water in his mouth, channeling his chakra to increase its pressure. Water release, bullet wave, he shouted, releasing a rapid succession of water bullets aimed directly at Satetsu. The water bullets shot through the air, each one powerful enough to pierce through rocks. Satetsu instinctively manipulated his iron sand, hardening it to form a shield against the onslaught of water bullets from Fukasaku. However, the sheer piercing power and size of the water bullets were overwhelming. The water bullets, amplified by the immense chakra and size of Fukasaku, bypassed Satetsu's iron sand defense with surprising ease. Several bullets struck Satetsu directly, one hitting his right abdomen and another his left shoulder. The impact was devastating, with chunks of flesh missing from both places. Blood flowed freely from his wounds, and the pain was unlike anything he had felt in a long time. How are they so huge and so fast? Satetsu wondered, his mind racing as he worked tirelessly to dodge the remaining barrage of water bullets. He hadn't bled in years, not since he had become the Kazakage. The realization that he was bleeding now was alarming and infuriating. Seeing Satetsu fully focused on Fukasaku, Yano and Renjiro seized the opportunity to free Hiro and Sama from the sand. The sand encasing them had hardened significantly, making it difficult to break through. The sand is hard. Do you know how we can get them out? Renjiro asked, glancing at Yano. Yano nodded and formed a hand sign. He then took a step back and shot out a series of bullets from his mouth. Renjiro immediately recognized the technique. Wind vacuum bullets, he thought. This powerful wind release variation was something he had encountered during one of his fights in the Chunin exams. It was a technique he had always admired and planned to learn one day. The wind bullets tore through the air with incredible speed, their cutting power amplified by the chakra Yano infused into them. As the wind bullets struck the hardened sand, they began to chip away at it, creating cracks and weak points. Their efforts started to yield results, and the sand began to crumble away and they freed their comrades. You're quite the nuisance, Satetsu said, his tone still composed but now tinged with irritation. Despite his injuries, he continued to dodge Fukasaku's relentless attacks, but his focus was divided. He was aware that Yano and Renjiro were freeing their comrades, and it was a situation he couldn't ignore. They are freeing their comrades. I can't do anything since the summon is keeping me busy, Satetsu thought. He could feel the weakening grip of his sand, an extension of his own body, as Yano and Renjiro freed Hiro and Sama. Seeing that Sama and Hiro were finally free, Minato swiftly teleported the entire squad onto Fukasaku's back. Your comrades are free, but I am sure summoning such a powerful summon must have taken a significant amount of your chakra, Satetsu remarked, noticing them all on top of Fukasaku. There's also that strange movement technique of that Jounin. Is it teleportation? No, that's impossible, Satetsu. He's just incredibly fast, Satetsu thought, trying to rationalize his opponent's abilities. While Satetsu's taunts echoed through the desert, Minato's gamble was becoming more apparent. He had hoped everything would go according to plan, knowing his chakra reserves were dangerously low. 
Summoning Fukasaku and teleporting his team multiple times had drained him significantly. You are now turning this fight into one of attrition. Are you sure you can wear me out if I continue dodging, or better yet, my people will soon realize what's going on and provide support, Satetsu said, his voice calm yet threatening. So why don't we stop all these theatrics, and you turn yourselves in? He proposed. There is no way out for them without significant losses, Satetsu thought confidently. But Suchikage sends his regards, Minato remarked, a sly smile playing on his lips. Huh? It seems you're the stubborn type who, Satetsu began, but Minato cut him off, yelling, now, Fukasaku-sama. Hold on tight, then. Fukasaku shouted as a large cloud of smoke enveloped them. In an instant, they all disappeared, leaving the Kazakage standing alone and confused. As the smoke cleared, Satetsu stood, momentarily disoriented but quickly regaining his composure. He scanned the area, expecting an ambush or another trick, but found only silence and the remnants of their battle. His thoughts raced, trying to piece together the sudden disappearance of his opponents. Satetsu stood amidst the shifting sands, the vast desert stretching endlessly around him. His eyes narrowed as he replayed the last moments in his mind. Reverse summoning, he thought grimly. I should have expected this from the beginning. And to think I was confident that I had them cornered and they had no way of escaping. He shook his head in frustration. The absence of evidence does not mean the evidence of absence, this is what you always say whenever you conduct any experiments. Realizing there was no immediate threat left to fight, Satetsu decided to recollect his iron sand. He extended his hand, and the dispersed grains began to quiver. Since obtaining his magnet release, Satetsu had relentlessly experimented with manipulating Shikaku's sand. This had significantly enhanced his control making Satetsu's chakra so potent that it subtly affected the normal sand of the desert. This made the entire desert his playfield. This was why Minato, Yano, and Renjiro had been trapped in the quicksand upon their arrival. As the iron sand coalesced into one large mass, Esetetsu muttered to himself, there's no point in even looking for them, he began, that summon doesn't seem to be around here. For all I know, they might be a thousand miles from here. He sighed, I should probably head to Sakai to help Ri. She might even have more information about those attacks. But before he could leave, Satetsu sensed several presences approaching. His chakra awareness was not as acute as other sensors, but it still did the job and he quickly recognized the familiar chakra signatures. They were Sunagakir Shinobi, so Saitetsu was not alarmed. Even if he hadn't identified them, Satetsu wouldn't have been alarmed. As the King of the Desert, he commanded enough power to ensure his safety. This moniker, King of the Desert, though not as widely recognized as the White Fang of Kanoha, was a moniker some of his subordinates had started calling him. But it just made him realize that only nicknames given by enemies and rivals truly caught on. Letting them get away would look bad as the King of the Desert, Satetsu thought as he waited for the five shinobi he sensed to arrive. They did not take long, moving swiftly across the sands before coming to a halt in front of him. Immediately, they bowed deeply. Lord Third, they said in unison. The team comprised one Jounin and four Chunin, their eyes fixed firmly on the ground. Satetsu's gaze fell on the Jounin, whom he recognized instantly. Mikio, I did not expect to see you here, he said, addressing the Jounin who was evidently leading the squad. Still bowing, Mikio responded, yes, Lord Third. We were accompanying Lord Ebizo, but since the number of attack towns kept increasing, he decided to split us apart so that we could cover more ground. Satetsu nodded, understanding the strategic decision. Smart move. The situation is escalating quickly. What news do you bring? Mikio straightened, his face serious. Lord Ebizo has instructed us to track and report on any suspicious activities. We've encountered several villages devastated by unknown attackers, and we believe they may be trying to incite conflict between our villages. But as we were making our way back we sensed a fight here which caught our attention. So they don't know much. Satetsu's expression hardened. I see. I encountered some suspicious people on my way to Sakai and decided to confront them. Unfortunately, they managed to get away. While they may have escaped, they might still choose to continue with the attack so when you get back to the village, pass the message to the council. For now, I will head to Sakai, since they were also attacked. 
Lord Kazakage confronted them but they still escaped? How powerful were they? Mikio and some of the other shinobis thought. Understood, Lord Third, Mikio said, bowing once more before turning to his team. Let's move out. As Satetsu floated away on his sand, one of the chunin in Mikio's squad, couldn't contain his worry any longer. Mikio-sama, if they escaped even when they were against the Kazakage, will they be caught? The question echoed the silent fears of the squad. For them, the Kazakage was the epitome of strength and power. The notion that a group of shinobi had not only survived an encounter with him but had also managed to escape was deeply unsettling. It was as if a pillar of their belief had been shaken. Mikio, sensing the unease, took a moment before responding. He needed to calm his team. Don't worry, Raza, he said, his voice steady. I'm sure they just got lucky. Remember, the Kazakage-sama is unparalleled in strength and wisdom. Focus on his orders and leave the worrying to him. The reassurance seemed to placate the squad, and they picked up their pace, hastening back to the village. Mikio's words did the job for now, but he couldn't shake off his own lingering doubts. As Satetsu floated toward Sakai, he was deep in thought. Despite the town already being attacked, he needed to ensure whether the Hoki clan had any more information on the attackers before making any decisions with the village council. His mind kept replaying Minato's words, that Suchikage sends his regards. Did that geezer Anoki send him? Satetsu wondered. He was not a big supporter of IWA, but something in him told him that there was more to this than met the eye. He suspected there was a deeper conspiracy at play. However, he needed concrete evidence to convince the village council to act cautiously. Any hasty decisions could escalate tensions and potentially lead to war, a scenario he was determined to avoid. Finally, Satetsu reached Sakai. The sight of the damage done by the attackers made his heart ache. He genuinely cared for the citizens of the Land of Wind. Buildings lay in ruins, and the once bustling town was now a scene of chaos and despair. Satetsu searched for Ri, to gather more information. He did not find her in her office, which was understandable given the circumstances. So, he floated above the city, scanning it from a bird's eye view until he spotted her amidst the crowd, assisting her people. Not wanting to disrupt the already fragile situation, Satetsu sent a small stream of sand to her as a signal. He couldn't afford to waste any time, and he needed her full attention. The subtle gesture worked. Ri noticed the sand and excused herself from her duties, delegating her responsibilities to her sister before moving to a more private location. Satetsu landed softly beside her, Ri, what happened here, he asked, Ri took a deep breath, before recounting the events of the previous night to the Kazakage. So there were only three? Satetsu asked. Ri nodded, confirming his suspicion. The shinobi I confronted were five in total, but the way they vanished into thin air was the same as how three of them initially arrived at the scene. They're likely part of the same group. If they're only a part of a larger contingent, it could become a significant headache for us. Satetsu said. Ri began, but even from other towns, the jutsus they used were primarily earth nature. It seems either they're trying to frame IWA, as you suspected, or... Or they simply used that jutsus because it was quicker and easier for them, Satetsu finished Ri's sentence, catching on to what she was implying. Satetsu sighed, it seems IWA really might be behind this. Without solid evidence to oppose this notion, the council will be quick to assume the worst. They won't even want to consider any reasons behind the attack. It seems we might be heading toward another war, he concluded silently, the weight of the potential conflict heavy on his shoulders. In the land of Earth's capital, tensions were mounting. The recent murders had not only shaken the populace but had also directly impacted the daimyo. Unlike in the Land of Wind, where Satetsu had the relative freedom to maneuver with the village council, the situation in the Land of Earth was being blown out of proportion. The daimyo, directly affected by the situation, was pushing for a swift and decisive response. Satetsu's situation was delicate but manageable. As Kazakage, he wielded significant influence within the village council, which comprised various village and clan elders. While he had to inform the wind daimyo due to the broader implications of the attacks on the nation's food supply and security, Satetsu had the advantage of being the one to break the news. He knew the daimyo well and could placate him if necessary. 
However, he was acutely aware that if the daimyo were to become directly involved, the matter would become significantly more complicated. Meanwhile, in the capital of the land of Earth, the atmosphere was tense. The Earth daimyo looked intently at the Tsuchikage, Anoki. So, what is our response going to be, Anoki, the daimyo questioned. Anoki, who was well into his years with his hair now balding and gray, glanced at Asa, who was standing across from him. The Tsuchikage let out a deep sigh. He had known Asa since he was a boy and had always treated him like a son. But recently, Asa had become distant, his actions unpredictable which worried him. Anoki's mind raced back to the events that had led to this moment. He was aware that Asa had made a trip to the land of Earth's capital, but he had not been privy to his exact plans. The sudden emergency summon had caught him off guard, and finding Asa in the midst of the turmoil was an unpleasant surprise. He was so innocent when he was younger, Anoki thought, when Lord Mu died, I promised to raise him like my own son. I don't know why he's become so impatient. Does he think I enjoy being that such a kid? This is a tremendous responsibility. I don't even see myself as such a kid in the next five years. As soon as Asa masters Lord Mu's Kekiai Tota, I'll gladly retire and leave the seat to him. Lord Daimyo, while there are suspicions that the attackers were from Suna, we can't just go ahead and attack them. Our relationship with Suna has deteriorated over the years, and this could lead to a full-scale war. Anoki pleaded, before continuing, starting a war with Suna right now wouldn't be beneficial for either of our countries. We are still in the recovery phase after the last war. Starting a new conflict would set us back significantly in the progress we've made. Besides, I am wary of the other Kages. They are like vultures, always looking for an opportunity to take advantage. Kanoha, Kumo, and Kiri would pounce on any sign of weakness. They would exploit the situation, just as I would if I were in their position. So, should we just ignore the crimes they committed against us? The daimyo asked. No, Lord Daimyo. Yuzui responded promptly. You know how the nobles feel. They will demand some form of compensation to appease them. If we do nothing, you might lose their favor. Yuzui's remarks seemed to sway the daimyo causing him to sink into thought, his fingers tapping rhythmically on the armrest of his seat. He is making sense, I need to do something, the daimyo thought. Yuzui's words made sense. The nobles were a powerful faction, and their support was crucial. Anoki, standing a few steps away, interjected, but Lord Daimyo, we cannot afford a war. Our forces are not enough, and we haven't been getting enough missions to support us apart from the funds you provide. The daimyo's gaze hardened as he considered Anoki's words. The financial strain was indeed significant, but the political pressure was equally daunting. I don't like doing this, but it seems that I have to, the daimyo thought. He took a deep breath and spoke, Anoki, I am sure you know that the nobles who I am trying to appease could very well rally and force me to reduce the funds we allocate to Iwagakure, making the financial situation that you are talking about worse. So help me help you. Anoki's fists clenched involuntarily. The implications of the daimyo's words were clear. The funding for Iwagakure was already stretched thin, and a further reduction could cripple the village's daily functioning. Did he have to resort to such tactics because of a few nobles? Anoki thought. The relationship between shinobi villages and their feudal lords was complex and symbiotic. While shinobi were often seen as tools of war and peace, they depended heavily on the financial and political support of their lords. In turn, the lords relied on the shinobi for protection and military prowess. It was a delicate balance, and any disruption could lead to significant consequences for both parties. Seeing that there was no way out of the situation, Anoki sighed deeply and made a decision. Fine, I will make plans to retaliate against Tsuna, but it will only be for show. If they also respond similarly, then we can put this matter to rest. I just hope that Satetsu does not escalate this. Anoki thought. The daimyo's face lit up with a smile, his tension easing. I knew you would see my reasoning, Anoki. Thank you for your cooperation. Anoki bowed slightly, his mind already racing with the plans he needed to make. As soon as the meeting concluded, Anoki quickly left for Iwagakure with Asa by his side. The journey back was filled with heavy silence, Anoki cursing under his breath at the situation he found himself in. He blamed Asa for much of the turmoil, believing that Asa's actions had exacerbated the crisis. Little did Anoki know that Asa had, in fact, 
averted a far greater disaster. By forcing Minato and his team to evacuate the Earth capital quickly, Asa had prevented Yano and Renjiro from carrying out plans that could have unleashed further chaos. As the two major shinobi forces prepared to retaliate against each other, Minato and his squad found themselves in the tranquil environment of Mount Mayaboku. Mount Mayaboku was a place of surreal beauty and mystery. Waterfalls cascaded down cliffs, creating sparkling pools and streams that meandered through the lush foliage. The air was thick with the scent of flowers and the sound of croaking toads, adding to the serene atmosphere of the place. The squad had been reverse summoned there by Fukasaku to escape the dangerous situation they faced in the Land of Wind. However, this reverse summoning had not been straightforward. Fukasaku had only been able to reverse summon Minato, the one with whom he had a summoning contract. The moment Minato arrived at Mount Mayaboku, he was briefly exposed to the natural energy that permeated the environment. This exposure enabled him to gather just enough Senjutsu Chakra to teleport his squad to safety. Senjutsu was still something Minato was learning, he had not completely mastered it, but he had found a way to use it to supplement his chakra needs in dire situations. Minato looked around at his team, is everyone okay, he immediately asked when they arrived. We're fine, Hiro replied, though his voice carried the weight of their recent ordeal. Sama nodded in agreement. Thanks to you and Fukasaku-sama, we're safe. Renjiro, though not a user of Senjutsu, could subtly sense the natural energy present. It wasn't a direct sensation but rather a prickling pain that reminded him of the first time he scaled the floating mountain where Uno and her kind lived. It seems that the natural energy here is not as dense as it was in the floating mountain where Uno and her kind live. Maybe it is because that was a mountain on a floating island, Renjiro thought. However, there was little time to sightsee. As soon as they arrived, Minato turned to Renjiro and Yano, I need to know how your part of the mission went? We decided to make our move from the Earth capital and bet on the chaos that would ensue to attack all other locations around the country because we feared that if we did the opposite, we might lower our chances of success as IWA and the country at large would be more alert and increase security in important areas, Yano began, explaining their strategy to Minato. Minato listened intently to his colleague who continued, after agreeing on that, Renjiro and I snuck into a caravan which helped us get into the Earth capital. Once in the capital, we killed some nobles with Renjiro using his clones to frame the IWA shinobi who were with Asa to confuse the enemies while also framing Suna shinobi. How did he do that? Minato asked. Yano turned to Renjiro, who was standing there absent-mindedly. Only after a nudge from Hiro did Renjiro come back to his senses and answer, originally I had planned to use clones, who, using the transformation jutsu, would turn into the IWA shinobi accompanying Asa. Afterwards, I intentionally let them be discovered. They then engaged the guards in an exchange of attacks and faked their injuries, turning into Suna shinobi, to make it seem like it was their true form before they dispelled themselves. That was a clever idea, Minato thought before asking, but why did you say that it was what you originally planned? Did something change? Renjiro hesitated before saying, I somehow made a mistake and used the Shadow Clone's Jutsu. Minato's eyes widened slightly. Which could be traced back to Konoha? Minato considered this for a moment. Do you think that's how Asa discovered you? Before Renjiro could answer, Sama, who had been listening intently, interjected, are we talking about Asa, the elite Jounin from IWA? Yes, he is now an S-rank shinobi, Minato confirmed. While Sama was surprised at this fact, Yano shook his head and said, no, after he discovered us in the market, he kept on asking who we were and how many people we were working with. So it's entirely possible that me using the shadow clones created more doubt in their minds as to who was truly behind the attacks. It did? Renjiro wondered, hearing Yano's analysis. You may be right, Minato began, nodding his head. With the shadow clones turning into Suna Shinobi, they wouldn't be sure if it was Konoha impersonating Suna or the other way around. Either way, that was unintentionally brilliant. Good work, Renjiro. Minato's smile reassured Renjiro. I don't know why or how it happened, but I'll take it, Renjiro thought, a bit relieved since his mistake did not have a devastating effect on the mission. And that led to the confrontation you witnessed when you arrived, Yano began again. But I would like to know how the Kazakage found you guys. 
Minato went ahead to explain how their part of the mission unfolded. He detailed their strategies, which involved attacking various towns on their way to the Wind Capital. The goal was to create a cascade of chaos, ensuring that Suna would undoubtedly retaliate, setting off a domino effect of attacks between the two countries. That would have been more work, but it ensured more damage. This means that Suna will undoubtedly retaliate, setting off a domino chain effect of attacks between the two countries. We would have done that, but the land of Earth is more connected in regard to communication as compared to the land of wind. Yano thought when he heard Mianto's approach. After Minato finished his explanation, Hiro took over, detailing how the Kazakage stumbled upon them immediately after Minato left. I guess we were just unlucky, Hiro said with a sigh. It seems so, Minato agreed, but I am glad that throughout the mission, our true identities were never revealed. We will rest for a day as we monitor the situation and prepare for our next A-rank mission. I did not know that A-rank missions were this tiresome, Renjiro muttered as he found a place to sit. Although his time in the Earth capital had been cut short, he had been running on adrenaline for almost a day continuously, and he was really tired. He felt the weight of exhaustion settle in as he finally allowed himself to relax. Hiro and Sama joined him in resting, both sitting on either side of him. The three of them formed a small, exhausted trio in the serene environment of Mount Mayaboku. Having a summon can be useful sometimes, Hiro remarked, enjoying the scenery and the brief respite from their mission. Have you thought of getting a summon, Renjiro? Sama asked, turning to face Renjiro. Renjiro hesitated for a moment before answering, No, I haven't given it much thought. With my work in the force, I don't have much time to focus on my training. Sama's question had caught Renjiro off guard, and he hesitated before lying. I don't need to tell the truth. If I ever reveal Uno or any of her kind to them in the future, I'll just say seeing Minato's toad inspired me, Renjiro thought to himself. What about you? Renjiro asked, redirecting the conversation. I have, Sama admitted, but I have heard that it is quite dangerous using summoning seals. So I am waiting on my luck to come across a powerful beast I could enter into a summoning contract with. What about you, Hiro? Renjiro asked. Hiro shrugged. I've also considered it, but I'm waiting until my chakra reserves grow since I have a lot of chakra intensive jutsus. Having a summon would be detrimental. Besides, in my clan, we don't enter into a summoning contract with one beast but with a group of them, so the chakra needed is more than average. That makes sense. Renjiro thought as he was aware of the kind of summons the Hataki clan had. The three of them sat in silence for a while, each lost in their thoughts. The peaceful environment of Mount Mayaboku was a stark contrast to the intensity of their mission. As Renjiro closed his eyes and leaned back against a tree, he allowed himself to drift into a light sleep, knowing that his comrades were doing the same. While Minato and his squad were resting in Mount Mayaboku, in the town of Nagoya, which was close to the borders of the land of wind an old man with a straw hat made his way into the town. His gray hair peeked out from under his hat, and he walked barefoot, relying on an old cane for support. The old man moved through the town with a careful eye, taking note of the current security measures and the number of shinobi guarding the area. His presence was inconspicuous, and he blended in with the ordinary citizens going about their day. He observed the patrol routes of the shinobi and the layout of the town, committing the details to memory. As he wandered through the streets, Osaka made his way to the town center. He paused, taking in the scene around him. The town was lively, with merchants selling their goods, children playing, and villagers going about their daily routines. It was a stark contrast to the other towns he had encountered, which had suffered destruction and chaos. Finally, a town that was not destroyed, Osaka thought to himself. He stood there for a moment, contemplating his next move. I wonder if Lord Anoki sent other people besides me to cause some destruction here. Osaka's mission was clear, create enough destruction to make it seem like a sufficient response but not enough to draw the full wrath of Suna. This delicate balance was crucial, as it was meant to be a strategic show of force without escalating into a full-scale war. That Tsuchikage had given him the leeway to choose which town to attack, which greatly benefited Osaka. However, he had faced a bit of trouble finding the perfect town to destroy. Minato and his squad had already wreaked havoc on most towns south of the Land of Wind, 
leaving a trail of destruction that was meant to confuse and mislead Suna about their true intentions. Even towns that posed no strategic value were destroyed, giving Suna the illusion that the attacks were arbitrary. This tactic created a state of heightened alertness throughout the Land of Wind, but it also made Osaka's task more challenging. Most towns had already been attacked, and finding one that hadn't yet felt the sting of chaos was becoming increasingly difficult. Fortunately or unfortunately for him, his search had come to an end when he entered Nagoya. As Osaka stood in the town center, he overheard a conversation between two shinobi. I heard there was an increase in patrols because of the recent attacks on nearby towns, one shinobi said, his voice low but clear. Yeah, we need to stay vigilant. The Kazakage is counting on us to keep this place safe, the other replied, nodding seriously. How honorable, Osaka thought, a faint smile playing on his lips. He continued his walk and approached a tea shop. He sat down at a nearby bench. The vendor, a kind old woman with a warm smile, approached him. Would you like some tea, sir? She asked, her voice gentle. Osaka nodded, returning her smile. Yes, please. The vendor handed him a cup of steaming tea, and Osaka took a sip, savoring the warmth. He struck up a conversation with the vendor, casually inquiring about the town and its recent events. We've been lucky so far, the vendor said, her expression shifting to one of mild concern. Many towns around here have been attacked, but Nagoya has remained safe. Osaka nodded thoughtfully, his eyes scanning the busy marketplace. It's good to hear that. The people here must feel fortunate. The vendor sighed, her shoulders slumping slightly. Yes, but there's always a sense of unease. Osaka took another sip of his tea, the steam rising in delicate curls. I understand. These are uncertain times. The Kazakage has increased patrols and security, but there's only so much they can do. We just have to hope for the best. Osaka finished his tea and handed the cup back to the vendor. Thank you for the tea. You're welcome, she said, smiling again. Stay safe, sir. After a few steps of walking away, he subtly tapped his bare foot on the ground. A slight tremor rippled through the earth, and a second later, the tea shop exploded. Boom! The explosion caught everyone around the shop off guard. The force of the blast threw people back several meters, screams and shouts filling the air as they were flung about like ragdolls. Amidst the chaos, no one noticed that Osaka remained unscathed, his face calm and expressionless. Within moments, shinobi guards, who had been on high alert due to recent attacks, rushed to the scene, trying to assess the situation and help the injured. Osaka watched their frantic efforts for a few seconds before tapping his foot three times on the ground. This time, the buildings neighboring the tea shop exploded with an even more powerful boom. The second explosion was more devastating, involving three buildings. The shockwave heavily injured the shinobi who had rushed to the scene, with only a few managing to escape unscathed. Debris rained down, and thick clouds of dust and smoke filled the air. People screamed and ran in all directions, the once peaceful town of Nagoya was now a scene of utter chaos. Osaka stood amidst the destruction, his expression unchanged. This was his speciality, he was a master of destruction, capable of causing mayhem with a mere touch to the ground. Osaka had been born into a family of skilled shinobi in Iwagakure. From a young age, he exhibited exceptional talent in manipulating Earth Chakra. However, during his training at the Ninja Academy, a tragic accident destroyed his chakra pathways, rendering him unable to wield chakra effectively. Devastated and on the verge of giving up his shinobi dreams, Osaka discovered an unconventional method to channel chakra by making skin contact with the ground. By transmitting chakra into the earth, Osaka could do wonderful and quite destructive things like create powerful explosions, prompting him to walk barefoot to maintain constant contact with the ground. This unique ability to cause explosions had gotten him recruited into Iwagakure's most powerful squad, the Explosion Corps despite him not exactly having explosion release. While Osaka's power was not the strongest compared to other members of the Explosion Corps, his ability to go undetected while making explosions made him invaluable. Even experienced shinobi with dojitsu like the Byakugan would have a hard time figuring out what he was doing due to his messed up chakra pathways. With the guards incapacitated or busy helping the injured, Osaka continued walking through the town, causing more buildings to explode. As Osaka moved further into the town, 
He overheard snippets of conversation from the panicked townsfolk. What's happening? Why is everything exploding? Is it an attack? Are we under siege? Where are the shinobi? We need help. Despite the destruction, Osaka couldn't help but feel a pang of guilt for the innocent lives caught in the crossfire. The people of Nagoya were just ordinary citizens, unaware of the larger conflicts that shaped their fate. But Osaka pushed these thoughts aside, focusing on his mission. One of the guards, a young shinobi trying his best to make sense of the chaos around him, noticed the old man walking calmly amidst the destruction. You there, stop, the guard shouted, pointing at Osaka. Osaka ignored him and kept walking. The guard, determined to stop him as he suspected the old man, ran towards Osaka. As he got closer, Osaka tapped his foot again, and a small but focused explosion erupted at the guard's feet, throwing him back with a pained cry. The guard hit the ground hard, groaning in pain but still conscious. He tried to get up, but his legs wouldn't cooperate. What's going on, he muttered to himself, confusion and fear evident in his voice. Meanwhile, on the other side of Nagoya, a shinobi was sleeping in an inn. Her rest was abruptly interrupted as her eyes snapped open, sensing the danger before it struck. In a flash, she flickered away just seconds before the room and the inn as a whole exploded into a fiery wreck. What is going on, the kunoichi wondered, her mind racing as she surveyed the chaos around her. Without wasting a moment, she created several clones, which flickered back to the rubble to rescue those trapped beneath the debris. They worked quickly and efficiently, pulling people to safety and healing the injured as best they could amidst the chaos. She flickered across the town, her senses heightened as she tried to locate the source of the destruction. She arrived a few meters from Osaka just in time to hear the injured shinobi shout, there. That old man. He's the one causing the explosions. Hearing this, the kunoichi scoffed, recognizing the figure immediately. Changing her stance, she said with a sneer, I can see through that pathetic disguise of yours, Osaka. Osaka's expression remained impassive. Chio, he said, it has been long since I saw you. Chio glared at him, her eyes narrowing. I should have known it was you causing this chaos, she spat. Why are you here, Osaka? What is your purpose? Osaka's face remained unreadable. I have my orders, Chio. Just as you have yours. Chio's fists clenched. Orders to destroy innocent lives? How far have you fallen, Osaka? Ignoring her question, Osaka shifted his stance slightly, his foot tapping the ground almost imperceptibly. Chio, anticipating another explosion, quickly formed a series of hand seals, creating a barrier of earth to shield the nearby civilians from the impending blast. Boom! Another explosion rocked the area, even Chiyo's barrier was not spared since it was connected to the ground. Chiyo's eyes narrowed as she observed Osaka carefully, assessing his movements and calculating her next move. Reaching into her pouch, she retrieved seven kunai, infusing each with her chakra. With a swift motion, she launched them toward Osaka. Whoosh, the blade sounded as they slicked through the air. Osaka stared intently at the approaching kunai, considering his options. As the kunai neared him, he noticed something unusual. Suddenly, the kunai multiplied, their numbers increasing exponentially. His eyes widened in shock, realizing that he had underestimated Chiyo's skill. Osaka attempted to dodge the kunai by shifting his body and sidestepping. Normally, such maneuvers would have been sufficient, but against Chiyo, it was a different story. Her subtle hand movements, almost imperceptible, guided the projectiles out of their usual trajectories, making them home in on Osaka with relentless precision. He tried to evade the relentless barrage, but the kunai followed him with uncanny accuracy. In a desperate bid to escape, Osaka created small explosions beneath his feet, propelling himself into the air. Boom! The blast sent shockwaves through the ground, but despite his efforts, the kunai remained steadfast in their pursuit. Osaka's situation grew increasingly dire as the kunai continued their relentless assault. Desperation took hold, and in a last-ditch effort, he flickered toward a group of nearby civilians, using them as human shields. Coward! Chio shouted, her voice echoing with fury and disgust. She halted her assault, her eyes burning with rage at Osaka's callous disregard for innocent lives. Osaka smirked, I'm actually offended that you thought such an attack could stop me, he taunted, trying to rile her up further. Chiyo's hands almost trembled with barely contained anger. 
Then let me indulge you, she said. She reached beneath the gray cloak she was wearing and retrieved a scroll. Unfurling it quickly, she performed a series of hand seals. A cloud of smoke enveloped her, and when it cleared, three imposing puppets floated by her side. Shit, Osaka's expression shifted from smugness to wariness. It was well known that while Chiyo's healing skills were good, her puppeteering skills were not that far behind. Without wasting a moment, Chiyo commanded her puppets to attack. The first puppet, equipped with razor-sharp blades, lunged at Osaka with lightning speed. Osaka barely had time to react, dodging to the side as the blade sliced through the air with a whistling sound. The second puppet, adorned with a multitude of hidden compartments, unleashed a barrage of Sunban needles. Osaka tried to evade them but the needles were fast, grazing his arm. He winced in pain but maintained his composure. The third puppet, larger and more imposing than the others, charged at Osaka with incredible force. Its fists, reinforced with metal plating, came crashing down toward him. Osaka narrowly avoided the devastating blow, the ground shattering beneath the impact. Boom! An explosion of debris and dust filled the air, obscuring Chiyo's vision momentarily. She focused her chakra, enhancing her connection with the puppets, guiding them with precision and finesse. Osaka retaliated by tapping his foot on the ground, creating a localized explosion to disorient the puppets. The shockwave disrupted their movements momentarily, giving Osaka a brief respite. He capitalized on the opening, launching a series of explosive projectiles toward Chiyo. Chiyo's puppets moved in perfect synchronization, intercepting the projectiles with their reinforced bodies. The explosions reverberated through the air, but the puppets remained undamaged. Chiyo watched him, her brow furrowed in confusion. Why is he just dodging, she wondered. A shinobi of his caliber could fight back if he wanted to, so the fact that he was only evading her puppet's attacks grated on her thoughts. Meanwhile, Osaka was calculating his next move. How do I get myself out of this situation? I have already done the bare minimum, just like the Tsuchikage wanted, but knowing Chiyo, she wouldn't let me off that easily. I only have one card left to play, let's see if she can fall for it. Osaka continued to dodge and evade the puppet's attacks, skillfully creating some distance between himself and the puppets. Of course, Chiyo realized this and did not give him any space to breathe. This was precisely the bait Osaka had thrown, and Chiyo had fallen for it. I can't destroy these puppets as it will be a waste of energy since I do not know how many puppets she has in store, Osaka thought. Just as the third puppet was about to land a blow on Osaka, a young boy appeared in front of him. It wasn't that the boy appeared suddenly, it was Osaka who had purposefully led the puppets there. Is he trying to use human shields again? Chiyo thought as she realized that Osaka had led her to a residential area in Nagoya. Yes, the town was under attack, and most citizens had been evacuated, but there were still some who remained, looking for their lost loved ones. As Chiyo maneuvered her puppets to avoid harming the boy, she noticed something disturbing. What is happening, she thought, her eyes widening. More and more civilians, who were present, suddenly started launching themselves at her and her puppets like feral dogs. What did you do to them, Osaka? Chiyo shouted. Osaka smirked, what? You're attacking me with puppets, can't I do the same? This was another of Osaka's abilities. By transmitting his chakra into the ground he could entrap anyone standing on a particular radius around him into a Jinjutsu. It was like a reversal of his ability where he could affect the environment by transmitting his chakra through the ground. Fortunately or unfortunately it could only work on civilians as the resistance they could put up was worn down by Osaka's chakra. Its most notable downside was that it was chakra intensive, the reason why Osaka had chosen to dodge Chiyo's attacks and not retaliate. The civilians continued to charge at Chiyo and her puppets, forcing her to split her attention between controlling her puppets and defending against the frenzied townsfolk. She expertly maneuvered her puppets to subdue the civilians without causing them harm, but it was a delicate balance that took immense concentration. Osaka took advantage of the chaos, if I can keep her distracted long enough, I can escape. He tapped his foot on the ground, creating a small explosion that sent a shockwave through the area. Boom! The explosion created more confusion among the civilians, and some of them were knocked off their feet. Chiyo struggled to maintain control of the situation, her frustration mounting. Osaka, you won't get away with this, she shouted, her voice echoing through the street. 
Watch me, Osaka replied coldly. He tapped his foot again, creating another explosion. This time, he used the momentum to propel himself away from Chio and her puppets, flickering through the smoke and debris. Where is he? Chio's eyes scanned the area, trying to locate Osaka through the haze. She directed her puppets to contain the civilians and then dashed after Osaka. Osaka moved swiftly through the streets of Nagoya, his bare feet making minimal sound against the ground. His focus was on escaping. He was sure that he had done more than he was required to do for his mission Chio was close on his heels, her speed allowing her to close the distance. Osaka tapped his foot again, sending another shockwave through the ground. Boom! The explosion created a massive crater, and Osaka used the debris to obscure his movements, flickering through the smoke and rubble. As Chio closed in on Osaka, Chio noticed a flicker of movement to her right. She turned just in time to see Osaka hurling an explosive tag at her. Boom! The tag detonated, sending a wave of heat and pressure toward her. Chio leapt to the side, narrowly avoiding the brunt of the blast. Osaka used the momentary distraction to gain more ground. Chio pushed herself harder, her legs burning with exertion. She couldn't let Osaka escape. As she rounded a corner, she saw him at the end of the street, his form silhouetted against the setting sun. Goodbye, Chio, he said. He tapped his foot one last time, creating an explosion so powerful that it shattered the ground beneath him. Boom! The shockwave was immense, sending debris flying in all directions. Chio shielded her eyes, her body bracing against the force of the blast. When the dust settled, Osaka was gone, leaving behind only destruction and chaos. While IWA had already begun the chain of events that would see them and Suna embroiled in skirmishes for at least a year, Minato's squad was still in Mount Mayaboku, unaware of the chaos their actions had set in motion. Even if they were informed of the consequences of their actions, they still wouldn't care since neither of the two major powers were currently allies of Konoha. Minato and his squad had already achieved the main objective of their mission. And we are even getting paid for it. It is fair play since all major shinobi powers do that, Renjiro would have thought if he had been aware of the situation. Minato didn't even bother checking the situation as he could easily send over a toad, with the help of Fukasaku, to see whether things were going in a direction beneficial to them. But he did not. This was because everything that happened was just a part of a never-ending war, as termed by his Jounin sensei. Even during the peaceful eras, villages were working on improving the quality and quantity of their forces. The first thing Minato learned about war from his Jounin sensei was that you had to know your enemy. If you succeeded in this, the war was half won since you would be able to predict their actions. Minato was not banking on the Kages, Saitetsu or Inoki, but on those who surrounded them. These included advisors, village councils, and even in some cases, the daimyo's court officials. These individuals, deluded into thinking they wielded power just because of their proximity to one, were easy to manipulate. Minato just had to fan the spark of war, and the fire would grow into an inferno, which he and his squad already did. So he just waited and relaxed with his team. It was dusk when Renjiro was still meditating. With Minato allowing them to rest, he did not consider training this time but instead meditated to save his strength for their next mission. Why is the chakra here different? Renjiro wondered as he continued with his meditation. While at first, meditation required his full concentration, after doing it numerous times over the last few years, Renjiro developed muscle memory that allowed him to somehow multitask while meditating, hence his intrusive thoughts kicked in. It is definitely different from the one in the floating islands, let alone the mountain. I remember Naruto having his senjutsu training somewhere here, so natural energy must be present. I wonder why it doesn't have an overwhelming presence here, Renjiro thought. Is it because the one Uno and her people can access is stronger? No, if it was, I am sure Naruto or even Sasuke would have somehow come across those birds. Even if they didn't include it in the anime or any story involving the franchise, it would be just plain bad writing. So it definitely cannot be the case. He concluded, nodding his head involuntarily. As he was thinking, he felt a mild prickling sensation on his skin. It wasn't the sensation he felt whenever he was close to natural energy. Minato, who he lied to saying that he was aware of Senjutsu from the first Hokage, had already told him that the natural energy in Mount Mayaboku was special since one could only absorb it intentionally, 
further drawing parallels between Mount Mayaboku and the floating islands. The sensation that Renjiro felt was like someone was looking at him. It would be easier than usual for someone to sneak up on him currently since his chakra field somehow did not work, something he confirmed with the rest who were going through the same thing. Eventually, Renjiro attributed it to the special nature of their environment. Sensing something was wrong, Renjiro snapped his eyes open. To his surprise, he saw Shima, the wife of the toad that saved his and the squad's lives. It really is her, Renjiro thought. Despite being mildly surprised, he did not let it show on his face as he continued to consider the situation. She is just as I saw her in the anime. While Fukasaku is large, can they control their body size? He wondered. You don't seem to be surprised, Shima, the female toad, said. Well, I guess seeing a huge toad before getting here was enough for all the shock in my system to be depleted, Renjiro replied in a respectful tone. Fukasaku surprised you? And yet you already have a summon? Shima said, which caught Renjiro off guard. How did she know, he wondered. Seeing the shocked look on Renjiro's face, Shima added, don't worry. I will not reveal this to anyone, it is not my secret to tell. This served to reassure most of Renjiro's worries, but there was still a part of him that remained uneasy. How did she know? Am I walking around with a sign saying I have a summon plastered on my forehead without knowing? Renjiro thought. Eventually, he decided to ask, how did you know? Shima did not immediately respond. She leapt closer to Renjiro before saying, for us beasts, we can sense when a shinobi is tied to another beast with a summoning contract. She paused briefly before continuing. Normally, this would not be strange and go unnoticed, but when one enters into a summoning contract with one of the sages, it becomes easier to spot them. You are basically like a walking sign. One of the sages? I am confused, Renjiro inquired. You really aren't sharp, are you? Shima teased. I am talking about the giant eagle sage. What was his name again? Shima began, pausing as if searching for a long-lost memory. Was it Fumio? No, he died and his daughter took over. What was her name? Yomo? No, it was rhyming. Yes, it was Momo. She must be the new eagle sage. You mean Lady Momo? Renjiro asked, his thoughts racing. Why is she talking as if Lady Momo was her junior? How old is she? Yes, her. It seems that she finally grew up, Shima said. Renjiro then asked, you mentioned that Lady Momo is one of the sages. Does that mean there are more? Of course, there are more, Shima replied. We are actually six. There's our great toad sage, who is somewhere on this mountain, followed by the snake sage, the eagle sage that I mentioned before, the mountain turtle sage, the monkey sage, and finally the tiger sage. The number of sages is limited since we all represent different aspects of nature, or the natural energy forming nature to be specific. Six sages? Different aspects? What the hell does this mean? Are they somehow related to the six paths? Something like the six paths of Senjutsu? Rinjiro thought, his mind spinning with this new information. How is this possible? Renjiro wondered. There have only been a select few who had access to or used Senjutsu. Besides Minato, Jiraiya and Naruto who learned from the Toad Sages, not much was mentioned about the other Sages. Kabuto learned from the Snake Sage and only Hashirama and Yugo used Senjutsu without us knowing how exactly they managed to do so. And all this excludes the summons as well as Kagaya's children. I think Yugo's case was similar to Ohashi and the Kurigen clan, but that does not mean that they did not learn how to manipulate natural energy from one of the sages Shima mentioned. Maybe I can find more clues about this if I go through his memories, something that I keep planning on doing but somehow keeps slipping out of my mind. But that said, Senjutsu is powerful regardless of who is using it, so it is a bit strange why this information was not revealed on the show. The fact that Shima just revealed this to me, means that at the very least Jiraiya or even Minato knows about this, so why was it not revealed in the show? Or did Shima just reveal this just because she found out about my relationship with Momo and the other eagles? Contrary to Renjiro's thoughts, Jiraiya or even Minato did not know about this unique fact regarding Senjutsu. The root cause was that Shima, Fukasaku or even the current Toad Sage did not feel the need to reveal this information to them. As their exclusive summons, why would they bother talking to their summoners about other summons? 
It was already hard to find a good shinobi to enter into a summoning contract with, especially those who were as talented as Jiraiya, so why would they waste their time informing him about their other rivals? Renjiro's case was different as Shima thought that Momo and her clan had already informed Renjiro about this since he was in contract with them. So revealing this information during a casual conversation with him was not a big deal to her. Different aspects of nature, he asked, needing clarification. Shima nodded. Yes. Each sage taps into a unique aspect of natural energy, allowing them to harness and manipulate it in ways that align with their nature. I wonder what they might be. Surely there might be one that is better than the others. I just hope it is the one the eagles use even if Momo is not sure if I am compatible with it. The good thing is if I am not compatible with the eagle senjutsu, I can just ask the other sages for lessons and see whether I might be compatible with their different aspects. But knowing how this world works, I might find that they are similar in nature, no pun intended, and are like wielding different weapons. I just hope in the worst case scenario that I am not compatible with any of the six paths, then the question will evolve from when I need to learn senjutsu to if I need to learn senjutsu. So, Lady Momo, the Eagle Sage, what aspect does the senjutsu path she uses represent? Rinjiro inquired, genuinely curious. Did that child not inform him about anything? Shima thought. But from the looks of it, he is young and if he is their only summon, then it makes sense that they would take their time teaching him senjutsu or better yet, revealing such information. The toad concluded. I am still surprised that Momo did not inform you of all this considering you are in a summoning contract with her clan and only her. But let's see, the eagle sage represents the dash Shima began to explain before she was interrupted. Rinjiro, the squad is gathering, we need to talk about our next mission, Minato called out. Come on man. Does it really have to be now? Shima was just getting to the best part. Renjiro thought. Seeing the serious look on Minato's face, he just inwardly shrugged and followed him since he knew Minato currently meant business and messing around wouldn't help anyone. Shima had also leapt way to leapt away, Minato called out to Renjiro, to leave Minato and his squad to their devices, so there really wasn't a reason for him not to join the squad meeting. As the squad had either been training or resting, Minato had been busy. He, along with Yano, had been planning their approach for the next mission. Once they finalized their plans, Minato decided to call for a squad briefing. Good, we are all here, Minato began, once Renjiro, who was the only person they were waiting for, joined them. I am sure we are all well rested, so we can begin our next day rank mission. Seeing the four shinobi in front of him nodding in acknowledgement, Minato continued. Our next mission is to eliminate a mercenary group. Eliminating a mercenary group? And it's an A-rank mission? The mercenary group must be powerful and also dangerous for Kanoha to designate such a mission. They clearly see them as a threat, Renjiro thought. Which mercenary group would we be going up against? Sama asked. Minato responded, it is Tetsuga Gumi. So, it is the Iron Fong group, Renjiro thought, recognizing the name. When he transmigrated, there was something that Renjiro had always found hard to wrap his mind around. It was as if he had an internal language translator that helped him communicate with other people. How it worked or came to be, Renjiro did not know. It was like watching a sub show in real life where Renjiro could tell and see that the other party was using another language, but all he heard was the dubbed version. It was so discomforting that Renjiro had to forcefully learn the language used, which was not any he recognized from his previous life so that things would feel normal. That's why when Minato mentioned the name, Renjiro was able to quickly translate it. I have never heard of them. Where is their base located? Hiro asked. I am actually thankful that this mission will involve some mercenaries. While it will be more dangerous, at least it will be more straightforward since we will just have to eliminate the mercenaries. I am sure it will help me blow off some steam. Wait, I am thankful the mission is going to be combat intensive. I just hope I am not raising any flags, Renjiro thought. Minato laid out a map on the ground, pointing to a location that the squad was in not too long ago. Their base is located here in no man's land. Tetsuga Gumi, or the Iron Fong Group, is known for their brutal tactics and exceptional combat skills. They have been causing trouble for nearby villages and have been hired by various rogue elements to carry out attacks against Kanoha's allies. 
Our mission is to infiltrate their base and eliminate them. Yes yeah, sure, of course, the village looked for probable cause. Regardless of what Minato says, the fact that it lies between Suna and IWA must be one of the reasons we are attacking them. Rinjiro thought, not buying anything Minato said after pointing to the location of the mercenary base. It was not like Renjiro had something against the village, as this was far from the truth. After losing everything when Yuzushiogakur was destroyed, Konoha had taken him in and gave him a new home. What Renjiro struggled with was the village's propaganda, especially when it was used to justify certain actions. The latest example was Minato's justification for their mission to eradicate the Iron Fong mercenaries. But he chose to keep those views to himself since airing them out would make it seem like he was aligned with Kanoha's interest which he was, at least for now. Knowing how major events would transpire gave him an edge which forced him to vow that once he had achieved sufficient power, he would re-evaluate his position in the political climate of the shinobi world. But that was a consideration for the future. For now, Renjiro decided to focus on the mission at hand. If the base is located in no man's land, is there a reason why we did not focus on this mission first? Hiro asked, with a puzzled look on his face. Before Minato could respond, Yano answered. Despite the region being branded no man's land, it is still a territory between two major shinobi powers. So, if either of them wanted to exert their control in the region, it would be easy for them to do so. Instead, the Iron Fong and other mercenary groups have existed there for a while. Yano paused before continuing, this means that the mercenaries have some sort of relationship with the two nations. If we had started dealing with them, we could risk them asking for help from either of the shinobi powers. If they did, the situation would be a bit harder for us to complete our sabotage missions in both countries. Since all of Iwa's and Suna's focus is on each other, it would be harder for them to support the Iron Fong mercenaries, Minato added once Yano was done. That makes sense, Hiro said, nodding thoughtfully. Rinjiro listened, absorbing the information. We arrived there on foot, and also spent a significant amount of time, so I am sure Minato had placed some seals there. Did he do so anticipating we would need a quick exit from both countries? He complained of low chakra reserves so I am sure if he had enough chakra, he would have teleported us there. Either way, that's the kind of foresight most shinobi wish they could have. When are we launching our attack? Sama asked, looking intently at Minato. We will begin our attack at midnight, Minato answered calmly. Huh? At midnight? Shouldn't we attack during the day? Renjiro couldn't help but ask, slightly surprised. Most of the missions Renjiro had completed had been under the cover of night, which had subconsciously made him think that most of their activity should be done at night. Night provided the veil of darkness, the natural camouflage that ninjas often relied upon to maintain the element of surprise. So, going after mercenaries, who were essentially shinobi without any allegiance to any village, at night seemed counterintuitive to him. Also, if we move immediately after this meeting, I might not have a chance to finish my conversation with Shima. I don't know when I will come back here or meet her again, Renjiro thought, feeling a pang of urgency. Why? Sama asked, turning to Renjiro who said, won't that give us the edge since they won't expect it? Sama chuckled before Renjiro could respond. An edge might work, but where's the fun in that, she said with a playful smile. Renjiro was taken aback by Sama's response. Fun, he echoed, puzzled. Yes, fun, Sama replied. You see, attacking at night is what they expect. It's the usual shinobi tactic. But attacking them at night doesn't mean it will be less effective. The idea is not just about surprise, but also about executing our mission when it suits our strengths. Minato nodded in agreement with Sama. Sama has a point. The mercenaries are highly skilled and alert, regardless of the time of day. However, attacking them at midnight allows us to exploit the darkness to our advantage. It's not just about surprise, it's about playing to our strengths and minimizing our weaknesses. Renjiro pondered Minato's words. Despite his initial reservations, he could see the logic behind the plan. Minato continued, we also have to consider the terrain and their defenses. The Iron Fong mercenaries are prepared for an attack at any time, but they have more sophisticated defenses during the day. At night, their visibility and ability to coordinate are reduced, giving us an edge. Renjiro nodded slowly. 
I see your point. It's not just about surprise, it's about leveraging every advantage we can get. Sama smiled, clearly pleased with Renjiro's understanding. Exactly. Most robbers plan their heists at night and everyone knows this, but they still succeed in their plans. Renjiro thought in conclusion. Do we know how many people we will be facing? Renjiro asked, attempting to get the briefing back on track. Minato responded, yes, the Iron Fong mercenaries are close to 500 in total. The majority of them are Jenins. Chunins make up about a fifth of their entire number, with Jounins being half as many as the Chunins. Hiro did the math quickly in his head. That makes 50 Jounins and 100 Chunins. What strategy will we use? None, Minato simply said. Once I disable any few Injutsu security measures and we enter the base, you three will handle the rest while Yano and I focus on the Jounins. Rinjiro's eyes widened slightly at the daunting prospect. That would be three against more than 300 people. Can the odds get much higher, he wondered. Hiro voiced his concerns, wouldn't that be too much work on our side? Yano chuckled, what? You'd rather deal with the Jounins? What Yano meant to say, Minato interjected, is that while we are dealing with the Jounins, we will also lend help to you guys. But you will be up against 50 Jounins, Hiro said, still uneasy. Minato nodded. First of all, we don't expect all the Iron Fong mercenaries to be present at the base, so the number of mercenaries we will face might actually be fewer. And secondly, this is not like the mission we just completed, so we don't need to hold back to safeguard our identities. It doesn't matter if they know we are from Kanoha. Renjiro couldn't help but chuckle inwardly. Minato can take out all the Jounins by himself. Heck, he could even decimate the whole group if he wanted to. After the briefing, Minato instructed the team to prepare, as they would be leaving in a couple of hours, much to Renjiro's regret. He had hoped to finish his conversation with Shima, but she was nowhere to be found, having been summoned by Jiraiya. It seems I will have to ask Momo about this, Renjiro thought. Once everyone was ready, they all said their goodbyes to Fukasaku. Minato then teleported them out of Mount Mayaboku. Once the teleportation was done, the squad found themselves in the same sandy and rocky environment they were in a week ago. Under the cover of night, two men strode through a dimly lit corridor. Muraoka, the taller of the two with his muscular build, led the way. He was the head of the Iron Fong mercenaries, a position that demanded respect and instilled fear. Walking beside him was his right-hand man and advisor, Azuma, who stood a shoulder-length shorter with a much more leaner build. Azuma had black hair, just like Muraoka, but the two men had their differences. Muraoka sported an uneven beard that was graying at the ends, giving him a rugged, battle-worn appearance. Azuma, on the other hand, had only a neatly trimmed mustache. Both men wore black jumpsuits similar to what most shinobi wore, allowing for ease of movement. Their jumpsuits were plain, distinguished only by the armbands on their right shoulders. The armbands were black to signify their jounin ranks, with Muraoka's bearing the symbol of two fangs, denoting his leadership of the organization. The armbands were the group's way of distinguishing members of all ranks as Chunin members wore white armbands, while Jenin sported green ones. So that's the current situation in the land of wind. The tensions are rising, and even the Kazakage contacted us. Should we take his offer? Azuma asked, his voice low but urgent. Muraoka didn't respond immediately. He took a drag from the cigarette in his mouth, savoring the bitter taste before exhaling and throwing it to the ground. He crushed it under his boot with a slow, deliberate motion, as if contemplating his next words. Finally, he spoke, no, Azuma. You know most of our jobs come from the Tsuchikage. If we take the Kazakage's offer, we will be burning that bridge. Muraoka's decision was based on a complex web of political alliances and enmities. Osaka's actions had forced Satetsu, the Kazakage, to act. Within the village council of Suna, Chio, the head of medicine and a powerful figure, and, driven by a personal vendetta, was screaming for retaliation which was more radical than Satetsu's plans. This internal conflict meant that Satetsu had to seek a compromise. He managed to convince the majority of the village council to use mercenaries instead of their own shinobi, thus avoiding direct involvement while still addressing the threat. But we need money to keep running, and the amount offered is substantial. If we don't take up the offer, they might turn to the golden wind or worse, 
the silent blade, Azuma argued, his concern evident. In no man's land, three major mercenary groups operated above the rest. They were the Iron Fong, Silent Blade, and the Golden Wind. The Silent Blade was Muraoka and Iron Fong's biggest competitor, while the Golden Wind was the most recent entrant to the scene. I'm sure they already have the Golden Wind, but they still want us. I won't choose one job over the constant stream of work that Suchikage sends our way. Besides, if we stay out of this and the Silent Blade accepts the offer, we can still align ourselves with Suna if they win and then attack Silent Blade since they will lose their numbers. Just give them an excuse now, like we are too busy with other missions in Kanoha or Kumo, Muraoka said, lighting another cigarette. His tone was final, leaving no room for further debate. Azuma, though not entirely convinced, knew better than to voice his disagreement. He understood how stubborn Muraoka could be. With a nod, he accepted his leader's decision and resolved to decline Suna's offer. As they reached Muraoka's quarters, Azuma was just about to say his goodbyes when both men turned their heads simultaneously toward a distant direction. They heard a series of shouts, breaking the stillness of the night. When the squad reappeared, they found themselves in a stony and sandy environment. Renjiro recognized the place instantly. Back where we were, he thought, noting the familiar terrain. It was indeed the spot where they had set up a couple of weeks ago. Despite the wind sweeping away any traces they left behind, the dents and cracks on the surrounding rocks, caused during their training, remained as markers of their previous presence. I could have teleported us nearer to the base, but I feared it might alert their defenses, something we do not want, Minato explained. Hiro nodded in agreement, understanding the precaution. The squad then began moving east, quickly locating a nearby river. They followed the river upstream, knowing the base of the Iron Fangs was situated further along. As they moved, Hiro couldn't help but nudge Renjiro, I know there are other mercenary groups here. What will we do if some decide to act as reinforcements for the Iron Fangs when we attack them? Renjiro smirked at the thought. Mercenaries helping each other, he mused. It was an amusing concept. While he hadn't had many direct interactions with mercenaries, he had read and heard enough about them to understand their nature. Mercenaries offered their services to the highest bidders, and their lack of allegiance to any shinobi power made them even more wary of other groups. They were more likely to sit back and watch when one group was in a compromising situation rather than offer help. Now that I think about it, even the shinobi villages are like that. If helping you doesn't align with their interests, they might not honor the shallow pacts they form with you, Renjiro reflected. He turned to Hiro and said, you don't need to worry about that, Hiro. They rarely help each other since there is no honor amongst mercenaries. Hiro looked a bit confused but nodded, getting the gist of Renjiro's explanation. The squad continued their journey, moving with caution and purpose. After several minutes, they reached the base. When they were just a few meters from it, Minato signaled for them to stop. Minato took a few steps forward and began disarming the Fuinjutsu seal guarding the base. Renjiro activated his Sharingan, keen to observe and understand what Minato was doing. The seal Minato was working on was foreign to Renjiro, and he watched intently as Minato's hands moved with practice precision. It took Minato a couple of minutes to disable the seal. He then disappeared, presumably to work on another safeguarding seal, before reappearing a moment later. Minato turned to his squad and said, don't use your chakra fields until I give you my signal. I will make sure that you only find Chunin's at best when you get in. Yano and I will move first. Once I signal you, you can enter. As Minato was preparing to leave, Renjiro couldn't help but ask, no can I this time? Minato paused for a moment before a chuckle escaped his mouth. Don't worry, I'll make sure you won't need them, he replied, his confidence reassuring. Minato and Yano then moved toward the base. Contrary to Renjiro's expectations, they didn't disappear but instead split up, moving in different directions. Huh? What are they planning? Renjiro wondered. With only the three of them left, Renjiro, Sama, and Hiro stood in silence. Until Hiro decided to break the silence, wait, he didn't say how he was going to signal us. Just then, a loud explosion echoed through the area, boom! The ground trembled slightly, and a plume of smoke rose in the distance. Renjiro shrugged, I guess that is our signal. The three Chunins sprang into action, moving quickly towards the base. 
Renjiro's heart raced with adrenaline. Here we go. When Muraoka and Azuma heard the shouts they presumed to be from their men, they immediately became wary. The explosion that followed next clarified their suspicions, their base was under attack. What is going on? Azuma couldn't help but ask, his voice tinged with urgency. Muraoka, who shared the same thoughts, didn't answer. Instead, he sprinted towards the source of the explosion, Azuma close on his heels. They navigated the winding corridors of the base with practiced ease, the sounds of battle growing louder with each step. Suddenly, they came to a halt when a figure appeared in front of them. The man, with a distinctive uniform and blonde hair, spared their armbands a brief glance. Seeing the man's uniform, Muraoka's mind raced. Kanoha, he thought, recognizing the attire instantly. Before he could react, the blonde man vanished and reappeared next to Azuma, grabbed him by the arm, and disappeared again in a flash. What they, Muraoka began to mutter, his heart pounding. He readied himself for the next move, but before he could complete his thought, the blonde man appeared beside him, grabbed his arm, and they both vanished. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.